it's me again. I'm gonna talk again about your depression. I am an actual physician, and I think today we're going to do another exercise from dialectical behavioral therapy for your depression ASMR. Uh, as you know, I try to look for, you know, the most evidence-based techniques to educate you on. Um, and don't make any, you know, fake promises about, like, that this is going to treat your depression and magically make things go away, because the fact is, as a depression sufferer myself, having failed multiple medications and gone through years of therapists and, you know, 30 days, um, of hospitalization, like, I, let's just say, I don't think depression should be taken lightly, just like you should video that says this will cure your diabetes magically right away. But I do believe that the information I have to offer you is like really good adjunct for self-care to kind of help you. Um, and I do believe that it will help because that's where the evidence is, right? I try to do evidence-based stuff. Um, the exercise today, today is going to be called... Oh yeah, there's binaural sounds. Yeah, you dig that? I totally dig that. Yeah, man. It's gonna rock. Yeah. Yeah. Look. You matter. Even if they make you feel like you don't. Even if you make you feel like you don't, okay? I know just saying that doesn't fix it, okay? I have been there. Um, you know, where nothing anyone says matters, but it would have been nice, um, I feel like if people around me had at least tried to say some of those things, like, just the simple, helpful things, instead of being, like, so judgy and cold, you know? And so, um, I try to be real with you, but also, like, <laughs> say the things, like, you matter. You matter, you matter, you matter, and I have evidence that you matter. I have no problem saying that on the side to you. Because you're the only one of you. Okay? And I care about, like, if an endangered beetle disappears. When there's more endangered beetles than there are you. You are just one. One endangered species person. <laughs> Somebody really good at that in my comments section. I think it's, it's just super true. Extremely, extremely true. Yeah, I'm so happy. We are going to spend a little time today uh, talking about focusing on a moment. Uh, we did focus on a single object, and this one we're going to focus on a single moment. So, the point of these exercises, we've been talking about mindfulness and meditation in the first video in this series, which is two videos of up. Uh, these are all on the depression playlist, of course. Um, there's a lot of resources here because I feel like I would have liked to have certain resources would help me. Um, so there's an entire playlist of depression videos on the main uh, channel page. Um, and you can, you know, skip through by title to what you need. There's ones on grief, there's ones on PTSD, dialectical, behavioral therapy, um, all different kinds of things. There's also a relaxation club where I look into like evidence-based other ideas about like relaxation in general, not just mental health, um, every week, and that's also, you know, obviously as free as these videos are, um, that's down in the description. Um, it's not the same as like subscribing to this channel, subscribing to this channel doesn't get you the relaxation club stuff. The relaxation club stuff is stuff that I email you weekly, um, to kind of like, you know, help out, um, and keep you updated also on, like, things that are going on, um, not just with the channel, but with, like, my journeys around the world to find relaxing teas and other stuff like that, so that's in the description. Crisis helpline number is in the description. Um, there are ways in the description to get a therapist as well, okay? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Please hit the thing. So, 
been talking about mindfulness in dialectical behavioral therapy, as you probably know, as I've talked about before. Um, one of the earlier DBT videos, we talked about the evidence, the studies for it, for reducing suicidality and self-harm, and you can always check that stuff on PubMed. Um, that's cited in that video, so definitely hit that up if you're curious, or just search on PubMed. Um, I try to always tell you where I get information from and not just say things. I think that a lot of people online just kind of say things and they say, like, studies say. You can check me. PubMed.gov is a really easy way to check me. Um, and you can go to that video and I cite the specific authors and everybody else, everything else too. So the information is available for you. Without too much further ado, um, this exercise I'm going to read to you softly, softly, softly. And what you can do is do the exercise along with me. And if you want to do the exercise multiple times, um, which you'll probably want to, that'll probably be a good so if you want to do the exercise multiple times, then I will, I will recommend that you get the mp3 of this, but you don't have to. Um, if you hit up my Twitch, sometimes I give out free mp3s and you can request this too, um, so that you don't have to like, you know, I understand not everyone has money. Um, but this video is, you know, obviously freely available if you want to download the mp3. A lot of them are available at gumroad.com slash peterpan, p-e-t-r-e-p-a-n. The Twitch is twitch.tv slash peterpan, p-e-t-r-3, p-a-n. Um, and those are places that, like, you can get, you can get these mp3s, but, um, I'm here on the channel and we'll, we'll do it. Um, and if you want to, like, skip... Since I've been talking a little bit, just kind of letting you know what's up. The exercise starts about seven minutes in. Seven minutes into this video. So, in dialectical behavioral therapy, this is called a what skill. From Linnea 1993b. Meaning to help you become mindful of what you're focusing on. In the next chapter, we'll do some more advanced mindfulness skills. Which are called how skills. Let's focus on the present moment. It's simple to do, but it often has an amazing effect. The purpose is to help you become more mindful of your own sense of time. You'll need a watch with a second hand, or preferably a stopwatch. I don't know who has a stopwatch, I definitely don't. Your cell phone timer works just fine. Many people feel that time goes by very quickly, and as a result, they're always in a rush to do things and always thinking about the next thing they have to do, or the next thing that could go wrong. Unfortunately, this just makes them more unmindful of what they're doing in the present moment. Other people feel that time goes by very, very slowly. As a result, they feel like they have more time than they actually do, and they frequently find themselves running behind. This simple exercise helps you become more mindful of how quickly or slowly time actually so, find a comfortable place in a room where you won't be disturbed for a moment and turn off any distracting sounds. It may help you to turn your phone face down so you're not looking at me. <laughs> okay, just listen. Begin timing yourself with your watch or stopwatch. Then without counting the seconds or looking at the watch, just sit. When you think that one minute has passed, check the watch again, or stop the timer, and then note how much time really has passed. Is that such a simple exercise? Did you allow less than a full minute to pass? That's how it always is for me, I just can't wait for that minute. If so, how long was it? Was it a few seconds? 20 seconds? If it wasn't a full minute, consider how this affects you. Are you always in a rush to do things? Because you don't think you have enough time? If so, 
what does the result of this exercise mean for you? Or did you allow more than a minute to pass? If so, how long was it? One and a half minutes? Two minutes? If so, consider how this affects you. Are you frequently late for appointments because you think you have more time than you really do? If so, what does the result of this exercise mean for you? Whatever your results were, it's no judgment on you if you have more time or less time. It's not like, oh, you're wrong. What a stupid you are. You don't know how time passes. Nothing like that. One of the purposes of learning mindfulness skills is to help you develop a more accurate awareness of all your moment-to-moment -moment experiences, including your perception of time. So if you'd like, return to this exercise in a few weeks after you've been practicing your mindfulness skills and see if your perception of time has changed. See if your perception of time has changed. So, I think this is a good baseline one to do and then check again and again. If you are someone who takes a lot of time, why is it? Is it because you're worrying and thinking about all kinds of other stuff? instead of being here and present? Or on the other hand, are you rushing because you have like that wheel turning, right? What's going on? Are you observing the world around you? Or are you just making it up, right? Because that's a big problem that a lot of us face is that we are inventing the world around us instead of seeing what really is. And perception is not reality, as much as they teach us that in the military. Reality is reality. <laughs> and allowing your perception to stress you out, like your perception, all these people definitely hate me, when you don't know, you can't read their minds, or the perception, I am worthless. On what evidence are you basing that? And what is your definition of you need to question yourself when you're questioning yourself, right? Learning to step back and focus on outside instead of inside. And by focusing on outside, heal the inside. It's a paradox. You are taking time to work on you by working on the outside, by working on like your interaction with the world. You heal the inside to help others on the outside, but you also help on the outside to heal the inside. You see what I mean? It's like a little paradox. What I'm saying is you can't be all locked in yourself. Depression can sometimes be very inward focused, very, I hate me, I hate me, I hate me, I hate me. Pride is, right, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best, right? They both have this thing where you're like, you know, it's like people who, people use the term narcissistic incorrectly. Um, that is a particular personality disorder, and no, everyone doesn't have narcissistic traits, okay? Um, so, don't use that word, unless you are a psychologist. <laughs> I'm gonna control your freedom of speech. But, in all seriousness, right? Um, that trait, that trait of, like, being very arrogant and self-focused, self-centered, it's the flip side of the coin of hating yourself and being self-focused. It's all looking inward. There's a saying, a fruit doesn't eat itself. It is most wonderful when it is eaten by something else. That's how it shares its seeds. That's why it doesn't have a nervous system. That's how it, that's how, you know, it is delicious and wonderful and tempting and purpose to get plants and animals, to plants don't eat fruit, to get animals to come eat it so that they'll carry its seeds in its fecal matter. It's a wonderful way that trees spread their seeds. And at the same time, the world is nourished, right? But a fruit doesn't eat itself. That's not what makes it wonderful. And so you don't want to be here eating yourself all the time. Whether you hate the taste or love the taste, you don't want to be eating yourself. Eating yourself, eating yourself, eating yourself. And it's difficult because like people like me, we can't stop. 
And that can even manifest sometimes in external, you know, self-injury, right? Um, so, these exercises are meant to help pause with those emotions and look outside and look outside. And eventually that gives you an opportunity, right? An opportunity as you're looking outside to see where you can help without pressuring yourself just where you can be eaten, where you as a fruit are able to nourish the world around you. But you have to develop kind of a realistic sense of self and others, and that's something that everyone has trouble with. Not just those of us who have mental illness, but everybody. Everybody has unrealistic senses of self. Well, if you're looking for outside ways to spread your nourishment, uh, Isabel's Orphanage is a really good one. Um, you can learn more about how she helps kids at hishandsupportministries.org slash Liberia. Um, that's all one word, no spaces, for sure. Uh, I did a video on her on the Superhero channel. Um, the Superhero channel is a great opportunity for you to, like, pick up ways that you can, like, think about helping other people. Um, it's called youtube.com slash c slash becoming a real life superhero, all one word. Um, and that's, again, to help you learn, um, you know, it, it helps, it really does help to outfocus, um, with a caveat, right, that it can also hurt, right, if you're, if you're making it, like, yourself image is dependent on things going well when you help other people, because they don't always go well, then it can be a problem, right? I've been there, right? That's something that I, that's something I know well. But if it's about, um, you know, if, if it's just something that you do with this mindful attitude, you know, you're, fo you're just focusing on what's going on outside. It doesn't become about, like, me. I have to become a great hero. I have to be good at helping people. I'm not doing a good job. I am doing a good job. All those different things. I'm not saying don't evaluate, um, you know, your performance, right? We all have to be able to look at what we're doing and say, oh, how could this be better? But separate that from yourself. Separate that from your worth. You know, like, look at the project and say, okay, what could make this better? Um, or even, like, if the project is, like, your behavior, like, when, as a physician, we practice, um, we used to do these practice sessions for, like, practicing things like bedside manner and things like that, um, which you wouldn't know because some people have terrible bedside manner, um, you know, and we would, we actually watched videos of ourselves doing it. Um, it's to evaluate your skill in an area not evaluate you as a person. So when you was watching those, I'd watch like, okay, what am I saying that I could say differently? What tone of voice could I be using differently, right? Things like that. So separate the thing that needs improvement from your core self. Being mindful is really like being able to step back, step back, step back, <laughs> step away. It's important to have a core identity, and that's why I always go back to the logo therapy from Viktor Frankl. Um, mine, obviously, my core identity um, has to do with you know my relationship with the Most High, the center of the universe. Um, and you know, obviously, in my belief, um, I would like that to be yours and everybody's, so that we are all you know connected and safe and believe in crazy things like heaven and hell and resurrection and Gehenna, Sheol, all these different kinds of things. But um, even among people who have the same belief system, your core purpose is going to be different. My core purpose is going to be slightly different than yours. Your core purpose is going to be different than the next person. Even if we have the same occupation, the same belief system, even if we were like almost genetically identical, it would be different. Because there's only one you, and you have been put on Earth at this time. And it's an amazing series of events that led to that. Like, all of history, 
all these different genetics, all the different things that had to happen for your ancestors to meet, to, to leave us with you here, right, at this time. And there will never be another you. There will be others who are genetically similar, maybe even with almost identical stories, but there will always be something. So your purpose, even if you could state your purpose the same as mine, there's actually going to be some differences, right? There's going to be differences. My outpouring of that has to do with, you know, how important it is for me to help teach people through pain, with the pain that I've had and the pain that I do have, um, and kind of demonstrate, like, beauty and pain and light in the even in the darkness, while being real about the darkness and not being like fake and religious. That's like a big core message of my life. It's like wading into this darkness and being hurt and having life suck and still, you know, and, and not being fake about it. And um, still finding that tiny hope in that terrible place, right? Um, and I, you know, this comes from experience with you know, holding dead people in my arms and, um, you know, cleaning up the emotional disaster mess after an assault, um, you know, like multiple of those, and then like seeing injustice and false accusations and lies and all these different things that happen, um, not in the context of assault, but in the context of people trying to cover up assault, um, or cover up systemic problems, right? Just a lot of different things. I have chronic physical pain, had a lot of deaths in my own family that were close to me. Um, so, a lot of tragedies, right? And my whole thing is like beauty through pain, like coming, you know, and um, that's kind of where, why I do this depression stuff. Um, I don't know if the end of my story is a tragedy or a victory, but my purpose is to share what I have of it with you. Uh, that's why I do the depression stuff in hell. That's why I wrote, you know, my book, my novel, Neodymium Exodus, um, which, yeah, like, got picked up by a real publisher, by the way. <laughs> Word Fire Press. Um, I don't know if you know Sci-Fi, Kevin J. Anderson, um, but his company, um, it's super cool, got a really cool review in Publishers Weekly, but a big undercurrent of it is, um, you know, wrestling through these questions of, like, suffering, um, and, and being yourself, and all that kind of stuff, right? Beauty through pain. The question of identity and beauty through pain. Um, and that's like my purpose as far as I understand it. As far as I understand it, I'm here to write stuff like that. Um, and if at all possible, try to encourage some of you all in your hero journey. As far as I can tell, that's my purpose. I don't know, I could be wrong. My purpose could be to be a comedy for you know, <laughs> but, um, whatever your purpose is, you, you have to find that. Your life's goal is to find the one who loves you and how to love other people. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, like, rely on, like, a person to love you. I don't, I hope I'm not saying too much. Um, yeah. I'm embarrassed talking about some of this stuff because when I share this stuff about me, um, it can be kind of weird because I'm a weird person and obviously we don't all agree on, on everything. The scientific stuff is fairly easy to agree on. The exercise of like pursuing a minute. How do you use your minutes? How do you grasp your minute? Can you take a minute to rest and how long is that minute if you How could you refuel in that minute? How can that act of you refueling then let you help refuel someone else? It's a continual journey. The part of mindfulness, the whole point, like I said, to step back so that you can see reality as it is, you can observe reality as it is, and then make the adjustments you need to make without feeling pressured and, you know, <laughs> without eating yourself. Find your purpose so that you are, you know, feeding 
others instead of eating yourself. <laughs> and uh, don't let people, like, waste your food. I think that that should be clear enough. I hope so. And when I said the one who loves you, I was not talking about a mate, just to be very clear. <laughs> I was talking about something a little deeper than that. But yes, it's important. You know, there's a passage in the Tanakh, and I repeat it in the Brit Chashah, that says, um, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you hate yourself, you're going to have some problems with your neighbor. <laughs> so, you know, the idea is to love your neighbor more than yourself, but you're not going to be able to do that if your standard is real low because you don't, you know, hating yourself isn't helpful. So learning to objectively look at, like, what are the ways I can improve and what are things that I've got going for me? Write those things down and be honest and don't be, oh, I have nothing going for me. Really, 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 really step back. And I, that's the whole mindfulness lets you step back and be honest so you're not, like, lying to yourself or with this, like, worthlessness. Question yourself. When you when something tells you in your mind that you're worthless, ask yourself, what do I mean by worthless? What is worthless? What evidence do I have for that? And, like, and, you know, if, and then what does that mean? And what does that mean? What's my definition of that? And like dig down, and a lot of times you'll find you have nowhere to stand with the worthlessness thing. Nowhere to stand. There's always, you know, I'm sure you've maybe seen the short that I did with like five very, very blunt evidences that you're not worthless. Go back and check that out. <laughs> but, um, you know, step back. Look at them all. 